Welcome back to the TPR86CC build series. I blew a CVT drive belt during one of the test rides on the last video, and once I got it home I did a full inspection and cleaning of the CVT, and during that I found this, which is a crack in my clutch belt. It doesn't go all the way through there, but when you remember that the clutch can be spinning even faster than the engine RPM because of the drive ratio, there's a lot of force involved, and I'm sure some of us have seen the videos of clutches and clutch bells exploding on the internet, so that's not something I wanted any part of. I bought all of this stuff at ScooterTuning.ca. They're up in Canada, but even with standard shipping, I got it within two days. They've got good prices, and they help this channel out by providing me with a discount on parts, so please make sure you check those guys out if you're looking for scooter parts. Anyway, obviously I got a clutch and a clutch bell here. So I, this is the Stage 6 MK2 uh, torque control clutch. This is actually the clutch that I've wanted since the first time I tried to replace the clutch on this thing. If you recall, some time ago I tried a DR pulley or Dr. Pulley hit clutch on there, and I was thoroughly disappointed with that thing. Basically it was a waste of money to me because I've been running the stock clutch. I got better results out of my stock clutch than I did out of it. This is what I actually wanted, but it has been out of stock pretty much everywhere for a long time. And luckily for me, it finally came in stock. Now, I couldn't get the 112 millimeter version, a, la a larger version of this clutch. They only have the 107 millimeter version. And I believe the clutch itself is actually 103.5 millimeters to match up with a 107 mil millimeter bell. But it appears that the 112 millimeter version of this clutch is now discontinued for Minarelli and Piaggio and all the engines. So this is basically what you can get is the 107 millimeter version. So I got that. I got a stage six clutch bell to go along with it. it. Matches this clutch and also allows you to adjust this clutch without removing the bell. I picked up a set of soft and a set of medium. So orange for medium, white for soft springs for these clutch for the clutch. Unfortunately, I didn't realize at the time, it actually comes with the white and the orange springs, so these would basically be spares, and I think they're actually even too soft probably for what I want to do. I believe I'll probably end up needing hard springs for these, and unfortunately those were out of stock. So I picked up a set of Polini hard springs, just hoping that maybe they would be the right size and actually work with this. Um, unfortunately, I called that one wrong and they're a little bit larger than these springs, so I don't think they're going to work for me. And stock springs are even larger than these are, so they won't work in there. I got the belts, obviously, because I'm blowing belts way too often. I told you in another video, normally I go through one of these drive belts and something like 100 to 200 miles, either change it out or blow it apart on the road. Um, so I had to pick up a few spares. When I was looking around, the belt that I normally use is a 6111108 Melosi belt. And that's an 815 by 17.5 by 30 belt. And then I saw that they listed a 618779 Melosi belt, which says it's 820, so it's 5 millimeters longer. And they say 17.5 millimeters wide, so the same as this belt, and the same angle. So I thought, well, hey, if I can get an extra five millimeters, maybe I can actually make use of that, and that might help my takeoff or my top speed or both if I'm lucky. So I want to talk more about these belts before I go on to the clutch. Actually, before I move on, I also wanted to mention that I have rebuilt my kickstart a little bit because it was getting pretty sloppy, and obviously that's the only way I have to start this thing, so if it fails, I'm kind of in trouble if I'm away from home. So I got a new lever directly from a Yamaha parts site and that fit quite well. It's for an 02 to 11 Yamaha Zuma with a two-stroke motor. I had uh, pretty much never used kickstart shaft around, so I put that in place. Again, I had a spring that was almost never used, so I replaced that. And all the rest of the stuff was in pretty decent shape. And I also want to mention while I'm here that I've started doing something a little bit different here with my CVT cover bearing. I have mentioned before that these have been a source of problems for me for a long time and I can pretty much just expect these bearings to go bad very quickly. I started making these aluminum bushings to go between the bearing and the primary drive shaft so it didn't wear as bad on the drive shaft or the bearing and instead I can just replace these aluminum bushings. I make them on the lathe and I make them a press fit. I've talked about those in other videos. Um, but when I was mentioning this in the past, I've always used a sealed bearing here, so they have metal shields. 
and go rc in the comments of one of the videos suggested that i try rubber seal bearings instead because they're better for dirty and gritty environments which the cbt is and so i bought a couple of skf bearings with rubber seals instead and installed those and that has been in there for two to three hundred miles now and you can see i've worn the bushing out a bit that's pressed into there but it still turns freely without noise, almost like it's brand new, and I haven't had any issues. And normally by now with a sealed or a shielded bearing, I would be seeing grease pushing out, it would be noisy, and it may even have excessive play within that amount of time. So a big thanks to GoRC because it looks like this may be uh, a permanent change for me. I'll probably continue to keep using these rubber sealed bearings instead of the shielded bearings in there. And if you're having the same kind of trouble, I would advise checking out a rubber seal bearing instead of the shield of bearing and see if it works as well for you. When we zoom in and take a closer look, you'll see the specs right on the packaging for both. So again, this is the belt that I normally use. It ends in 08, 17.5 for the width. You'll see over here, 17.5 for the width. So you would expect those to be the same. Unfortunately, I took these out of the packages and measured them. On the belt that I normally use, I can get as much as 17.5 millimeters across here for the width. But on this belt, it actually seems to be about 0.2 to 0.3 millimeters more narrow, even though it is rated the same. So I'm not sure why they did that, but that's what I found at least with this one. 815 millimeters for the length, 820 millimeters for the length here, and they both have the same 30 degree side angle. Now what you may notice is that there's also an extra number in here that we don't normally see when we look at belt ratings or belt sizes. You'll see here it has an extra 8 and here the extra number is 9.5. And what that is on these Molosi belts is the cross section, the thickness of the belt this way. So from the outside of the belt to the inside of the cogs or the teeth on there is 8 millimeters on this belt. And this belt is a little bit thicker with a 9.5 millimeter thickness across there. Here's my Melosi overrange kit with the belt that I normally use, the 611108 Melosi belt that's supposed to be 815 millimeters in length. That's installed with no fixed half here, that way you can see how it looks with it riding all the way up against the drive boss there in front. Now what I'll do is take a nice sharp tip marker and make a line showing how that rides where the outside of that belt is on the variator or the front pulley here. How the belt sits in the rear pulley is equally important, so here's a look at that, and I'm also going to go ahead and make a mark on the rear pulley around the outside of the belt a little bit. Now I've installed the 618779 belt, the one that's supposed to be 820 millimeters long. Again, it's sitting right up against the drive boss. I can tell that that extra thickness is not letting it sit as far inward as it would with the other belt against the drive boss, but again, I'm going to use a red marker this time, and I'm going to go ahead and put another mark around here so it will be easy to compare. Just by looking at it, it appears that there may be a slight advantage in this belt. It may sit just a little bit further outward in the rear pulley. And I'll also make a red mark back here on the rear pulley. Now with both belts removed, we can take a look at the markings that I made beginning at the front on the variator. So again, the black mark here is from the belt that I've been using, the one that ends in 08. The red mark is from the belt that is longer, that ends in 79. You can see, because of that thickness of the belts, the black marking here is closer inward, meaning that the belt that I've been using will ride further inward on the front pulley than the belt that is thicker, which is what we'd expect. And I've tried to measure this and it looks like somewhere close to a millimeter and a half of difference there. Again, what would ex we would expect based on the thickness of the two belts. So the closer you can keep that belt toward the center of the front pulley, the better it is for the gear ratio for takeoff. You get a deeper numerical ratio or more torque multiplication on your takeoff. So that shows us that the original belt I've been using, the shorter belt, is actually working a little better here for takeoff gear ratio at least, judging by what we see in the front pulley. 
Now when we look at the marks on the rear pulley, again the black mark is from the belt ending in 08, the one I've been using. And the red mark is from the pulley, or the belt ending in 79, the one that is supposed to be about 5 millimeters longer. And trying to measure those at their thickest points, it appears that the new belt here, the one ending in 79, gets about a half a millimeter closer to the outside edge than the belt that I have been using. So it would have a slight advantage for takeoff ratio versus the belt that I have been using. Looking at the system as a whole, taking into account both the front and the rear pulley for the belt position, and considering takeoff gear ratio, or getting the most torque multiplication from the engine on takeoff, what we see is that we've got about a millimeter and a half advantage on the front pulley for my original belt, the one ending in 08. And on the flip side, in the rear pulley, there's about a half millimeter of advantage for the longer belt, the one ending in 7.9. So I would think that because we've got a greater difference up front than what we have in the rear, that most likely I would get the best takeoff ratio out of the belt that I've been using, actually the shorter belt, just because that longer belt is so thick that it can't push inward as far on the front pulley. I'm not certain if the small differences here will make any difference for me in the real world, partially because with my current setup, generally the belt starts to move a little bit before the clutch actually engages. So if the belt moves out of these positions a little bit before the clutch engages and I'm actually moving, these small differences might not make any real world difference for me taking off. On the opposite end of the spectrum, if we were looking for top speed, then what we would want is for the belt to travel as far outward on the front pulley so as far as close as it can get to the outside edge of this front pulley and as far inward toward the inside of the rear pulley. In theory, I believe that the longer belt will have an advantage there. Obviously because first it's longer, so it may be more capable. But I don't think that it's going to matter as much about the thickness of the belt for top speed because I don't know if it's going to ride all the way to the inside there or not in the rear pulley. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a black mark all the way across the face of the variator, the front pulley here. From one inside edge here all the way to the outside edge. Now what I'm doing is I'm installing the 611-1108 drive belt, the same one that I've been using. And I'm installing just enough spacers to allow this belt to ride all the way in against the drive ball so that the fixed half here will not squeeze it up and further outward on the front pulley. And in this case, that happens to be 1.35 millimeters worth of spacers. Before I put the CVT cover back on here, I want to address one thing that quite a few people have said to me when I talk about how often my belts blow, and that is my pulley alignment. So I did directly after that try to get this aligned a little bit better. And what I did was I basically put a straight edge here, steel rule, across the cases. I used a set of calipers to measure the distance from that straight edge out to the, end, the uh, outside of my belt. I checked both back here by the rear pulley and right up here against the front pulley to see what the difference was. And I had about a millimeter, a little over a millimeter of difference um, in the two. My front pulley was setting out a little over a millimeter more than my rear pulley. So I changed the spacing the best that I can without running it into the cases. And now there's a, just over a half a millimeter difference between the front pulley and the rear pulley for the pulley alignment. So it's not perfect, but I think there are probably a lot of setups that are way further out of adjustment than mine and probably not going through belts the same way. I don't really think that half miller, millimeter ish of uh, difference there is really what's going to cause belts to blow every 100 to 200 miles. But I have checked it out and that's about as close as I can get without actually modifying the cases or something else. Now my plan is to test the belt out with acceleration and speed runs. So first I like to take any new belt and put at least 10 to 20 miles on it before I run it all out. So I'll take a little bit of a ride and then I'm going to do some acceleration runs which I'll time 
which I already should know what this thing does for 0 to 30, 0 to 40, 0 to 50, etc. But just to make sure I've got some fresh numbers and maybe I can use those later to compare when I put the clutch on. And then I'm just going to run it up to whatever its top speed is on a stretch of road. Um, I'm not worried about getting the all-out top speed. Again, the drive boss is spaced out, so that's not usually the best for all-out top speed, but it will allow me to compare just how much of the variator I'm using based on the mark that I put on there when I come home. Here's what the variator looks like after that test ride. You can see all the marker is erased in the center, and I've just got this outer bit here. So that's basically showing you how far outward my belt is traveling on the variator. And I'm sure some of you are thinking there's a lot left there. Um, and I'm pretty sure you could use heavier sliders, use less shimming, etc., and get the travel better than that. I'm not really concerned with that. I'm curious to see how this performs practically for me, how I would actually ride it around day to day because the bragging rights kind of figures like top speed and exactly how much belt travel I can get don't really worry me that much. So anyway, I got up to 71 miles per hour exactly according to my speedometer at 14,000 RPM. And I'm going to go ahead and measure this and that way I can compare it to what we see later when I try a different belt. And it looks like pretty much right on five millimeters left over here. Now I'm making a new mark on here. You can see I'm using a red marker this time. Now if it gets more travel than before, the color of it won't really matter too much because it's going to erase both of them. And I've already measured this, so that doesn't matter. But just to make it simple to see, um, just in case there's less travel, I'm going ahead and using a different color. Now I've got the 618779 belt installed. And when I installed this, I readjusted my shimming here on the drive boss. I removed about 0.2 millimeters of shimming, which is the difference in the width of the two belts, roughly. Um, and that is the best shimming that I can get where the drive boss, or the fixed half, excuse me, is not squeezing the belt up uh, when it's at rest here. It can sit all the way down against the drive boss. So that's just to be as fair as I can, real world setup for both belts, exactly how I would try to run them on the street going to reinstall this and then I'll go do the test over again. And by the way, when I take a shim out of there, I've got an extra one here, but when I took this shim out from the drive boss, I just move it around to the other side. That way it doesn't affect my spacing and I don't end up stripping the splines here on the crankshaft or anything else. went 71.7 miles per hour at 13,960 RPM with this belt. So that's 1.7 miles per hour faster and 170 RPM lower. So I would assume that it has worn both of these and it used a little more of the variator face. But let me measure and find out for sure. It looks like there's about 4.2 millimeters left this time. So about 0.8 millimeters more belt travel than I got before. Here are the results from all of my acceleration runs. As usual, I did multiple runs and I averaged them out. That way it remains a little bit more accurate. So you can see that either belt did basically the same from 0 to 30 and 0 to 40. But then when it was trying to accelerate to 50 miles per hour, the longer belt didn't do as well. And if you look at the RPM, it appears that what's happening is it just needs more RPM 
so it can be in peak power at that point and the longer belt is not keeping it there. Then when you look at the top speed there's 0.7 miles per hour difference between the two belts. The longer belt did a little bit better and it also dropped 170 RPM um, when it was at its max speed versus the shorter belt. So it looks to me like if I were to drop the roller weight by something between about a quarter and maybe four tenths of a gram, then I would probably have pretty similar results for the acceleration. And I have a feeling that my top speed would end up right about the same as it would with a shorter belt. So I don't think there's gonna be a whole lot of difference either way with these, but I'm curious to find out if that's actually true or not. The reason that I'm fairly confident in the amount of slider weight that I need to remove in order to get to the RPM that I want is because I have been keeping track of a lot of the 86cc test runs that I've done and the trends from the past seem to show me that about a quarter gram to four tenths of a gram should get me somewhere around 500 RPM um, higher. So I had 4.75 gram sliders in there and now I've moved to 4.5 gram. I was going to go a little bit lighter than that but that's the easiest solution that I can come up with right now because I want to do everything while conditions are fairly similar um, and I don't want to spend a bunch of time modifying my inserts for the sliders on the lathe or anything like that. So I'm just going to go with a quarter gram down. That'll be close enough to get an idea of what's happening. I've made a blue marking partially across the outside of the variator on the outer edge here so I can test the travel again when I do top speed and I'll go do some more acceleration runs and just see how it turns out. the blue mark from the last test ride hopefully you can see in their screen that it is a little bit thicker than the marks left over from the last run and that measured out to about 4.8 millimeters thickness so with the 08 belt the one that I've been using I got five millimeters with the same belt that I have on here now but with a little heavier sliders I had about 4.2 millimeters and now I'm back up to 4.8 Here's the information from that last test ride along with the information from the others. What I get out of this, obviously it's got just slightly slower acceleration than the other passes. It did pick up a little better in the top end by getting the RPM up. The RPM is very similar to the best results that I've had with it, even though it is still a little bit slower than the other results. I lost 1.3 miles per hour on the top end at 30 RPM more than either of the other belts by dropping just a quarter gram of roller weight. There is a possibility because there was some time difference between the first two runs and that last run that maybe the wind shifted around or something like that. Um, it's not a huge difference across the board anyway, but a slight difference. So. What I would say with this is that either one of these belts could work just fine. I personally would prefer the belt that I have been using, the 611108, because it does give good acceleration with a pretty good top end number. It sits tight on the drive boss and it just works well for me. Again, I don't really care about the top speed. I do think there is potential for top speed with the longer belt doesn't really worry me. Um, I kind of like what I'm getting out of the other belt, so that's probably what I'll stick with. But having an extra of the other around, I have no problem throwing it on there and using that as well. So these are the kind of things that I think are suited for racers and very serious tuners. People maybe like me that just kind of enjoy experimenting with this stuff. Um, for the average person, this is the kind of thing that wouldn't really make a whole lot of difference to you either way. And even for me, there's not much difference. Um, the only way I would explore this too much further 
as if I was actually going to race the scooter competitively or something where every last fraction of a second mattered. And all I'm going to do is race some rental scooters most of the time off the line or uh, cruise around at 50 to 60 miles per hour. Most of the time I'm even riding around at 40. So the extreme of the top end doesn't matter too much to me. And even a tenth of a second on the low end isn't a huge deal. Since I've been talking about sort of fine tuning with belts and talking about the thickness of a belt specifically in this video, I thought I'd mention something that you really don't hear many people talk about that's kind of a racer's trick, I guess. And that is modifying a drive belt for better performance. Let's say you were in a situation kind of similar to mine and you could find a belt that worked better for you with the length or the width, but it was just too thick. What I could do in this case would be to remove some of this thickness across each of these cogs or the teeth on here. You could do that anyway, basically, that didn't put too much heat in the belt and start melting anything. Um, sand it, file it, grind it. Again, just make sure you're not melting the belt and creating glaze on everything or any problems like that. And you would also have to make sure that you didn't get too close to uh, these ribs or these little dots that you can see going across here. Um, you just don't want to infect the structural integrity of the belt so much that the thing snaps. Although if you were truly a drag racer or something like that, you may not even care and you may want to push the limits. Um, but there is a possibility that you can do that to some belts and that will allow this to set even tighter against the drive boss because of that as I've shown you earlier in the video. And there's also a possibility that it could even go a little closer uh, to the center in the rear pulley and maybe you'd get a little top speed out, out of it. I think that is probably a little less likely. But that's kind of a racer's trick. I don't really have any desire to do this because the time to modify each one of these belts when I'm going to have to replace the thing within 200 miles anyway, uh, it's just not worth it to me. And I don't think it's going to be a huge gain. Again, this is for the people that are trying to get every last ounce out of it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this video up here. I had actually intended to make this video primarily about clutch tuning, and then I got kind of carried away with the belts and just my curiosity to see how it all worked and to share it with you guys. Um, but there is also an issue with the clutch. So I believe I mentioned earlier that I, meant that I ordered all of the uh, clutch stuff from ScooterTuning.ca and the hard or stiff springs were out of stock, which seemed to be what most people use with this kind of setup. So that's what I figured I probably need. So I looked around and I found that G-Force MX carried the stiff springs. They call them firm, but should be the same thing. And they also sell what they call extra firm springs, which I haven't seen anyone else use or sell. So I'm assuming that must be kind of their own thing. Um, so I ordered both of those. And I just got an email today that I was refunded some of my money because they don't have the firm springs in stock. And all I'm going to get are the extra firm springs, which I'm not even sure are going to be what I need. Um, the only place I see the firm springs in stock is overseas. I don't know if I'm going to resort to that yet. But also G-Force is apparently backed up right now, so it may take a while to get the order, a little extra time. Um, so I think I'm just going to call this video right now. And the next time I come back to the 86cc, hopefully I will have the springs that I need and be able to get the clutch in tune. So that's what I'll focus on for that. As always, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed the video, if you learned something, please give it a like, share it with your friends, and subscribe for more.